Okay, this is the fourth time I'm going to attempt the uh, lecture on the anatomy of the heart um, with the cardiovascular system. Hopefully, fourth time is a charm. So, we're going to go ahead and get started here. You say the cardiovascular system in the human being is a closed system. Um, closed circulatory system and we say it's a closed system because uh, blood is always within a vessel or the heart uh, an open system would be one that would be like an insect that would have blood partially partially in vessels and then at other times it would be draining through tissues by gravity until it got back into a vessel so Part of the time it would be out of the vessel, part of the time it would be in, and that would be an open system. Uh, in the human's closed system, if blood is outside of the heart or blood vessel, then you're bleeding. Blood's in the wrong spot. So, uh, generally speaking, in the cardiovascular system, heart's going to start out in the heart, uh, the blood's going to start out in the heart, it's going to beat, it's going to push blood through the blood vessels. Uh, they'll circulate through arteries, through arterioles, uh, eventually into the smallest vessels, which are capillaries. <clears throat> it will then go into venules, into smaller veins, into larger veins, until it dumps back into the right side of the heart in uh, by way of the vena cava. So the overall function, the thing that we're trying to get accomplished through the cardiovascular system, is we're trying to deliver blood to all parts of the body and the blood is going to be carrying all those things that it takes to keep a human being alive um, like oxygen and nutrients like glucose oxygen and glucose of course are going to be needed for a steady supply of energy in the form of ATP by way of cellular respiration as well as other kinds of nutrients that are needed in the cell and then uh, through these metabolic processes like cellular respiration, we're going to have waste products like carbon dioxide. They're going to be taken out of the tissues and delivered into uh, the blood vessel, the veins. And they're going to be delivered uh, back to the heart and eventually uh, to the lungs to take carbon dioxide out and replenish oxygen and go to the kidneys, which eventually will filter out all those metabolic wastes like urea and uric acid. <clears throat> the heart's location, uh, many people think the heart is slightly on the left side of the, of the chest. It's really not. It's really in the middle of the, of the thorax in an area known as the mediastinum, the middle of the chest. And uh, it basically tilts to the left. So that's why people generally get that idea that the heart is on the left side of the chest. Its orientation basically is that the, the pointed part of the heart, the bottom part, is going to point directly at the left hip. The base, which is the wider part of the heart at the top, is going to point toward the right shoulder. So it will tilt to the left side, uh, but it's basically in the uh, middle of the chest. Now, big people are going to have uh, bigger hearts and smaller people are going to have smaller hearts. And just as uh, the size of your fist would probably alter by the size you overall, overall the size of the body. So if you have a big fist, you probably have a big heart. If you have a little fist, you have a little heart. And so that's why we say it's about the size uh, of your fist. As you can see in the diagram here, uh, the heart's going to lie right underneath the, the sternum. And it's going to basically sit right on the... Uh, breathing muscle which is the diaphragm it will tilt slightly to the left now you got to remember when we're talking about inside viscera of a human being we're talking about the person's heart that we're looking at not ours so over here on, on B uh, as we're looking at the heart from a superior aspect um, and here, here we find the sternum right here, and this would be the anterior aspect. Uh, this would be the right side of the heart here, as it would be in that person. To us, it would be the left, but to the part 
the heart that's in the person that we're looking at, that would be their right uh, ventricle, and this would be the left ventricle. We can tell it's the right ventricle because uh, the walls are a lot thinner. You can also see another uh, different orientation that we have in the heart is that it's not sitting directly to where there's a right and a left uh, side. It's kind of twisted around, kind of, kind of twists clockwise about a quarter of a turn so that the right side of the heart is actually just a little bit skewed toward the anterior aspect. The uh, back side of the heart is more the left side. Okay, so we have a, we have a tilt and we have a little twist in the orientation of the heart. We can see here also as it sits uh, in the, the chest in the thorax region, we can see that it has uh, membranes around it, it has serous membranes around it. And we talked earlier in the year about serous membranes and mucous membranes. Serous membranes are not going to have opening to the outside as mucous membranes do. And there will be two serous membranes for all internal viscera. Uh, for the heart, we're going to have a membrane that adheres directly to the heart, which would be the visceral pericardium. And then there's going to be one that is on the outside, which would be the parietal pericardium. And in between those two would be a fluid, a serous fluid, that would act as uh, an agent in reducing friction when the heart beats. Here we can see the, the orientation of the heart. We can see the right side pointing almost toward the front with the pulmonary trunk here showing in front and then the aorta toward the back, which is what comes out of the left side of the heart. We'll be talking about most of these things as we go through the anatomy. So the pair, the, uh, in terms of the serous membranes, we have a, of a pericardium, uh, which is made up of a visceral and a parietal. Um, basically, we have a, a visceral pericardium, which lies right on top of the heart. Uh, in some cases, it's called the epicardium because it lies right on top or epi on top of the cardiac muscle. And the parietal pericardium is going to be that outside layer that lines the inner surface of the fibrous pericardium or the cavity. So there's going to be a serous fluid in between the visceral and the parietal pericardium, which would uh, reduce friction whenever the heart beats. There is a condition that is in your book that talks about inflammation um, of either one of these membranes pericarditis would be what it would be called. And anytime you have an inflammation of those serous membranes, it would cause uh, pain when the heart beats. So it's not a, not a very pleasant uh, inflammation whenever that occurs. You can also get inflammation of the cardiac muscle itself. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. <clears throat> As you can see here, this area right in between here is where the serous fluid would lie, and that's what would be the buffer or the pillow between uh, the two membranes, reducing friction as the heart beats. So overall, we have three layers of the heart. We have the epicardium, which would be the outside layer uh, adhering right to the heart, or the visceral pericardium, as it's called. The myocardium, which would be actually the cardiac muscle itself that makes up most of the heart, the middle layer. And then you have the endocardium, which is an epithelial layer. That's why it's called endothelium, because it's the inside lining of the heart. The endothelium, both in the heart and blood vessels, has to be extremely smooth. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about tissues um, back in first semester. Uh, this has to be very, very smooth so that we don't have uh, the blood, the platelets, or the red blood cells catching on rough surfaces and creating blood clots. So we want that to be nice and smooth. Here we can see uh, a cross section uh, of the heart where we can see all four of the chambers. We have the two smaller chambers at the top here, the atrium, atria plural, and then we have the ventricle, the larger chambers at the bottom here. We also are showing uh, the valves that are located between the different 
uh, vessels and chambers and chamber and chamber and uh, we also have the major vessels that are leaving the large ventricles. Now we have four chambers of the heart. Uh, the atria would be the ones that we call receiving chambers and they call receiving chambers because um, that's exactly what they do. They take blood from parts of the body uh, and they deliver them through the ventricles, which are the discharging chambers. The heart is a four-chambered heart, and we say it's a double pump for good reasons, because it literally forms two circulatory systems. Uh, the first system uh, would be on the right side of the heart, uh, delivering blood directly to the lungs and back. That would be the pulmonary circulation. And then uh, on the left side, we would have the systemic circulation where blood would go from the left ventricle out to all parts of the body and then back uh, to the right side of the heart. So the atria would be the smaller receiving chambers, and we have one on the right and one on the left, and the ventricles would be the discharging chambers, the ones that pump forcefully and uh, force blood out through the major blood vessels of the body. And pump uh, on the right side, it would pump through this um, pulmonary trunk, and on the left side would pump through the largest artery in the body, which would be uh, the aorta. Through this cross section, you can see the difference in the wall thicknesses of the left ventricle and the right. Uh, the right ventricle is not going to have to be nearly as thick because it does not have to pump blood as far as the left side does. Um, the right side of the heart would be the pulmonary cir circulation would pump directly to the lungs, which are right next to the heart, so it doesn't have to have as much force when it pumps the blood. On the contrary to that, the left side has to be very thick and very forceful uh, because it's forcing blood literally from the top of your head to the bottom of your foot. So in between each one of those chambers, we're going to have a septa, or what's known as a wall, a biological wall, and that's going to separate the ventricles and it's going to separate the atria. Um, in a four-chambered heart, we have uh, these uh, septa that separate uh, these chambers. In a three-chambered heart, say for instance in, a, in an amphibian, you have one big ventricle at the bottom, so you're going to have mixing of blood. As you go up the evolutionary ladder to the, rep the reptiles, you're going to have most of the reptiles also having a three-chambered heart, but some having a four-chambered heart. So there's a little bit of difference there. Uh, and the ones that have a three-chambered heart, they have a partial septum. So they're kind of getting ready to be a four-chambered heart. <coughs> In the birds and the mammals, we see four-chambered hearts, complete separation between oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood. And that would be separated by the septum. So if we're looking at the way blood flows through the heart, uh, we're, we're gonna, first of all, we need to mention that heart, the, the blood is only going to be flowing one direction. okay? And it's going to flow in one direction with no backflow because of four basic valves that are involved in the heart. Uh, whenever someone says they have a heart murmur, uh, they have an abnormal sound and that abnormal sound is due to an abnormal valve, okay? So these valves make certain noises whenever they're healthy and they make uh, very distinguishable weird sounds when they're not functioning uh, the way that they're meant to. Um, so if we want to start our uh, our journey through the heart, the, the circulation through the heart, we'd start in the, in the right atrium. The blood in the right atrium uh, then would move down uh, into the ventricle by way of what's called the AV valve, atrioventricular valve. The atrioventricular valve is also called, uh, uh, the, the right AV valve is also called the bicuspid valve, excuse me, the tricuspid valve. Uh, on the, on the left side of the heart, between the atrium and the ventricle, we have the bicuspid valve. Now, the reason why they're called bi and tricuspid is because these little cusps are like little cups. Uh, there's going to be two of them over two large ones over on the left side, and there's going to be three 
uh, a little bit smaller cusps in the valve on the right side. Now, uh, along with be being called the left AV valve and the bicuspid valve, the valve on the left side is more commonly called the mitral valve. So you have all three of those them to remember. The other two valves that are involved in the heart are between the large ventricles and the large arteries that exit the heart. Whenever the ventricle pumps, uh, it's going to close those AV valves to prevent backflow, and it's going to force blood through the semilunar valves. The semilunar valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk is going to be called the pulmonary semilunar valve. On the left side, it's pumping blood through the largest artery of the body, the aorta, so therefore it's called the aortic semilunar valve. And the reason why it's called semilunar is because uh, the little flaps that make up these valves kind of look like half moons. There are three little half moon shaped uh, cusps that make up the valve. <clears throat> so if we look over, um, we look at the heart uh, as it's uh, pumping blood, there are uh, some strings that attach the uh, cusps of the AV valves and attaches them to the wall uh, of the ventricle. And these uh, little cords that attach there are kind of like parachute cords and they're called chordae tendinae. They are fibrous connective tissue and uh, that's where the word heart strings come from, pulling on your heart strings, literally pulling on the, the valves that uh, prevent backflow in your heart, the chordae tendinae. So whenever uh, uh, blood is uh, coming from the uh, atrium in the top valve, basically it flows from the atrium into the ventricles in both parts by way of gravity. And then at the end of that, there's a contraction of the atrium which forces any extra blood down into the ventricle. And as that's happening, uh, we have uh, the AV valves opening. So during, uh, they're open during uh, heart relaxation, which is generally when we talk about relaxation and uh, contraction, we're talking about the ventricle. Uh, basically, uh, the AV valves are going to be open during heart relaxation when the ventricles are relaxing. And they're going to be closed during ventricular contraction because when the ventricle contracts, it's going to push up against the AV valve, forcing it to slap shut and prevent backflow. Uh, the semilunar valves are going to be closed during heart relaxation because they have just gotten through pushing blood forcefully through the artery, the main arteries leaving the heart, stretching them out and putting pressure on them. And then as the heart gets done beating, uh, and when it relaxes, the ventricle relaxes, it's then going to have uh, the heart or the, the uh, artery is going to relax and it's going to be pushing blood back toward the heart. In order to keep that from backflowing, the semilunar valves will then close uh, when the heart relaxes or when the ventricles relax. So you notice that the valves operate opposite of one another to force a one-way circulatory route through the heart. So... Uh, as blood goes through the heart, it will go from the right atrium to the right ventricle and go out through the pulmonary trunk to the lungs. It will return to the left side of the heart and it will go down to the uh, left ventricle and then out of the heart via the aorta. Here you can see the chordae tendinae of the uh, AV valves when they're open. And then it's going to give you the same uh, order uh, that we just got you talking about on the other slide. Blood returning to the atria puts pressure against the AV valve and it forces it to open. As the ventricles fill, the AV flap uh, hang limply into the ventricles as blood goes through them. And then the atria contract, force the uh, last bit of blood uh, into the ventricles. AV valves will be still open at this time. And then the ventricles start to contract. As the ventricles start to contract, they're going to push blood upward. And by upward, we mean they're going to push them against the uh, 
major arteries leaving the heart and against the AV valve. It's going to force those AV valves to slap shut. So little cusps will catch the blood and then slap together. The chordae tendon, they tighten and they prevent the valve flaps from uh, discharging back into the uh, atria or what we call prolapsing. There is a uh, disorder of those valves that we call a prolapse. Um, that's when there's too much give in the uh, flap. The chordae tendon A is either overstretched or there's something uh, wrong with the size or the function of the valve and the valve distends back into the atria to where it all actually uh, opens up a little bit and leaves blood uh, to trickle back into the atria. That's a prolapse. And so as the ventricles contract and the interventricular pressure rises, the blood is going to be pushed up against the semilunar valve, forcing it to shut and uh, slap shut the three cusps of the semilunar valve on both sides. As the ventricles relax then, and the interventricular pressure is going to fall, the blood flows back from the arteries back into the heart, fills up the leaflets of the semilunar valves, and then forces them to close. It catches the blood and it slaps the valve cusps back together again. So like I said before, we're going to have two basic circulatory routes uh, in, the, uh, in the heart. We're going to have a systemic circulation. We're going to have a pulmonary circulation. In the pulmonary circulation, we're going to have deoxygenated blood that's going to return to the right side of the heart from all parts of the body. And from there, the blood is going to be pumped out directly to the lungs right next to the heart. And then it's going to be returned back to the left side of the heart with oxygenated blood. In the systemic circulation, blood is going to flow from the left atrium uh, to the left ventricle. And then it's going to be forced out of the left side of the heart. And it'll be delivering oxygenated blood to all parts of the body. As that oxygen is taken out of the... Uh, of the blood by the tissues, the deoxygenated blood is then returned back to the right side of the heart to begin the pulmonary circulation again. So you can see the flow right here on this chart. Pulmonary circulation uh, coming from the right side of the heart to the lungs, the oxygenated blood then returns back to the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart then pumps blood out of the aorta, delivers it to virtually all parts of the body, and then once that oxygen, deoxygenated blood needs to be uh, replenished with oxygen, it's then returned back to the right side of the heart to start the pulmonary circulation again. Now, I've already mentioned these major blood vessels that are associated with the heart. These are the two largest arteries in the body. Um, sometimes the, uh, well, the aorta, as we said, is the largest one. It leaves the left ventricle. The pulmonary artery is also called the pulmonary trunk. And then off of the pulmonary trunk uh, branch the pulmonary arteries, the right and left pulmonary artery. In terms of veins, we have blood that's returning to the heart from above the heart and below the heart. Those that the, the blood that returns uh, from the superior regions of the body are going to return uh, to the heart in the right atrium by way of the superior vena cava. And the, the blood that returns to the heart by way of or below the heart is going to return by way of the inferior vein cave, superior meaning above the heart, inferior meaning below the heart. And then there will be pul four pulmonary veins um, that are going to enter, they're going to enter the left atrium. So as we look at the heart overall, and we look at the blood flow through the heart, I'd like you to know, uh, be able to trace the blood flow through the heart. So the superior and inferior vein and cava are going to dump their deoxygenated blood into the right atrium. They're going to take blood from all parts of the body. From there, we want to oxygenate the blood. So from the right atrium, blood is going to flow through the right AV valve, the tricuspid valve, and travel 
into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, blood will flow through the uh, pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary trunk. From the pulmonary trunk, it will branch into the right and left pulmonary arteries that can carry blood directly to the lungs to be oxygenated. Now, one of the things you always hear is that arteries carry oxygenated blood and um, veins carry deoxygenated blood. There is an exception to that, and that is the blood going to the lungs and back from the lungs. The, uh, the easy way to remember arteries and veins is that A uh, stands for artery, which is taking blood away from the heart, AA artery away. So any blood vessel that's taking blood away from the heart is an artery and any blood vessel that's bringing blood to the heart is a vein. So the pulmonary artery takes deoxygenated blood to the lungs and it brings oxygenated blood back to the heart by way of the pulmonary veins. Oxygen is then picked up in the uh, in the lungs and carbon dioxide is dropped off. Oxygen rich blood, red rich blood, is returning to the heart through the four pulmonary veins that are gonna dump into the left atrium. Uh, the deoxygenated blood is gonna be a dull, uh, almost a maroon-like color uh, because of the lack of oxygen. As the oxygen can uh, bonds with the hemoglobin of the red blood cell, it turns those red blood cells bright red. As they lose their oxygen, uh, the, the blood turns darker. It is not blue, as some people think. From the left ventricle, the blood is then going to leave the heart via the aortic semilunar valve and the largest artery in the body, which is the aorta. It's then going to flow through the aorta, branch into large arteries, which will branch into smaller arteries, which will eventually branch into the smallest arteries, uh, which are called the arterioles and those will lead into the smallest vessels in the body which are the capillaries. Uh, in the capillaries is where we deliver oxygen uh, and nutrients, glucose, to the cells and then we pick up uh, waste products. So from the capillary blood will then start its journey back to the heart by way of the venule, the smallest veins in the body. It will then move to smaller veins and then to larger veins, and then to the eventually into the largest veins in the body, which would be the superior and inferior vena cava, which will dump into the right atrium of the heart. <clears throat> now, once again, a lot of people get the misconception that because there's so much blood in the heart that the heart is constantly being served by the blood that's inside of the heart. The, heart, uh, the blood that's inside the heart is not serving heart muscle itself. It is literally uh, passing through. The uh, aorta carrying oxygen-rich blood has its first branch off right as it exits the heart. The first branch would be the coronary artery. The coronary artery would then quickly branch into other arteries that literally take blood and supply the, the heart muscle with oxygenated blood right fresh from the aorta. So the very first internal organ to receive oxygenated blood is the heart itself. So blood goes through the aorta and immediately branches and goes right to the heart muscle itself. Uh, as uh, the oxygen is being taken out of the blood in the heart by the heart muscle, this uh, deoxygenated blood then is drained uh, into what we call the coronary sinus which is a large vein on the posterior part of the heart, and it receives blood from the cardiac veins that are dumping the deoxygenated blood there. Blood empties into the right atrium via the coronary sinus. So that's your blood flow um, in and out of the heart and also throughout the body. <clears throat> Next thing we would talk about would be the uh, physiology of the heart the conduction system, and several other things. Uh, that's going to be our next talk. A couple of, um, of the uh, homeostatic imbalances that uh, I want to mention here. First of all, a lot of people, uh, when they think of the heart, they think of uh, heart attack. And the word uh, myocardial infarction is the scientific term 
for heart attack. It is um, myocardial, meaning the heart muscle itself, the cardiac muscle, is being de deprived of oxygen-rich uh, blood. In other words, it has an ischemia. This ischemia can be caused by either a buildup of plaque in uh, one of the arteries feeding the, the muscle tissue of the heart, or by a blood clot that has been captured in one of the narrowed arteries. And either way, it's going to cut off blood flow to an area of the heart, and the heart will then experience literally heart pain, and that heart pain is known as uh, angina, uh, angina pectoris, and basically this is a warning sign for ischemia in the heart. The word infarct is a word that has to do with death of tissue. So literally, uh, when you have a myocardial infarction, uh, you literally have death of tissue in, in that area of the heart that's being deprived of oxygen-rich blood. That uh, area that is deprived of oxygen uh, will die, but many times the person will still survive. That, that person will live with a compromised heart. Uh, by that I mean the uh, damaged tissue will eventually heal. It will cover the area that was once cardiac muscle with scar tissue, and that person will live with a heart that is only partially functioning because the area that was once cardiac muscle is now scar tissue, which does virtually nothing but just fill in uh, for the dead tissue. So uh, a myocardial infarction causes death of tissue that is replaced by scar tissue. And as you know, uh, scar tissue is basically a, a fibrous connective tissue that really doesn't, doesn't have any contractible qualities at all. So that is a, a myocardial infarction. And the next time we talk, we'll talk about the physiology of the heart. Adios, amigos.